Good morning, I'm Taylor Wilson, and today is Wednesday, October 23rd, 2024. This is The Exit. Today, what a decision in Georgia means for county election board members in a major battleground state. Plus, what polling tells us about Americans' views on what will happen after Election Day. And Donald Trump keeps leaning in to a hyper-masculine approach to male voters in the final stretch before November. Georgia's top court declined yesterday to hear an appeal made by Republicans of a decision blocking a new rule that would have required poll workers to hand count ballots. Voting rights groups warned that such a challenge could have caused chaos. The decision means that county level officials in the state will not have enhanced authority to challenge precinct level results. The state Republican Party said in a statement that it did not plan an appeal of the decision before the election, but called the move disappointing. The rules passed by the Georgia board's Republican majority would have empowered county election board members to investigate discrepancies between the number of ballots cast and voters in each precinct and examine election-related documents before certifying their results. One controversial change would have required poll workers to open the sealed boxes of ballots scanned by machines and conduct a hand count, starting as soon as election night. Voting rights groups had said the rule could allow rogue county election board members to delay or deny certification of election results. Georgia is one of seven battleground states expected to play a major role in deciding next month's election. With less than two weeks to go until Election Day, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump are neck and neck in the race for the White House. An exclusive USA Today Suffolk University poll released Monday puts Harris at 45 percent and Trump at 44 percent, a closer race than the poll found in August. And polling tells us election angst won't end on Election Day. I caught up with USA Today Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page for the latest. Susan, thanks for making the time as always. Hey, Taylor, it's always a pleasure to be with you. So, Susan, interesting uh, findings in this polling. Let's start with the results themselves of the election. What did our polling find here in terms of trusting results and then ultimately accepting those results? And what was the breakdown between Harris and Trump supporters? You know, most voters think they can trust the vote count. But what's of concern, I think, in this poll is that about a third of Trump voters said they were not confident that they could trust the vote count. And you see the repercussions of that when you ask, will you accept the results as legitimate? 24 percent of Trump voters, that's about one in four, say they are ready to refuse to accept Kamala Harris as a legitimately elected president if Trump should lose. You know, we've heard stories about threats against election officials, but it seems like most respondents have some level of trust in their local election officials. What did you find on this point? much more trust in local election officials than in those in other states or other places. That includes among Trump voters who tend to be skeptics. Uh, Eight out of 10 Trump voters say they trusted their local election officials. Even more of Harris voters said they did. You know, this may be a case of people see their local operations or local vote operations. They go to the polling places and they see how they work. So they believe that they're being run well but then they hear stories or allegations about what is happening elsewhere. And that's what raises this level of skepticism about whether the vote is going to be accurate and fair. And, you know, Susan, one of the interesting parts of this poll that really stood out to me was how different groups of supporters would feel after the election. Uh, What did you find here? You know, you really see how stressed people are about this election because we gave people four choices of how they might feel the morning after the election, depending on who won. And in both cases, whether Trump wins or Harris wins, more people said they would be scared than they would be enthusiastic. 37% of the people we surveyed said they would feel scared if Trump wins. Just 23% would be enthusiastic. If Harris wins too, it's a negative finding. She tilts negative. 30% would feel scared. 27% enthusiastic. I think that just says where we are in our politics today. Wow. And, you know, Susan, it appears there are uh, real concerns about potential violence after Election Day. How big are those concerns? And did respondents feel a a peaceful transition of power will happen? Americans are braced for violence, for political violence around the election. Two thirds of the people we surveyed said they are concerned about the possibility of violence on Election Day and afterwards. And there was a divide, a partisan divide on this question, but it's kind of the reverse of what you might have expected. Almost all 
Harris supporters are worried about the prospect of violence. 86 percent, nine out of 10. But almost half of Trump supporters are not particularly concerned. So much lower levels of concern about violence among Trump voters than among Harris supporters. All right. So, Susan, another interesting aspect here, uh, whether the loser should go to the inauguration. What did the findings center on here? A clear message to the candidates from the voters, don't be a sore loser. Most Americans think they should go to the inauguration, even if they're not going to be the one being sworn in. All right. Less than two weeks to go. Susan Page is USA Today's Washington Bureau Chief. Thank you, Susan. Hey, thank you. A federal judge yesterday ordered Army officials to release internal records regarding Donald Trump's controversial August visit to Arlington National Cemetery by the end of the week. Judge Paul Friedman of the U.S. District Court for D.C. granted the request Monday in response to a lawsuit brought by American Oversight, a nonpartisan group dedicated to getting the government to release records. The group said he signed the order yesterday. American Oversight said it sued for the rapid release of military records including any incident reports from the August incident following a Freedom of Information Act request. The judge's ruling stems from Trump's visit to the U.S. military cemetery for a wreath-laying ceremony honoring 13 soldiers who were killed in Afghanistan during the U.S. military's withdrawal from the country. A cemetery official tried to enforce rules against political campaign activity at the site and was abruptly pushed aside by Trump staffers, according to an Army statement. The cemetery official contacted police, but ultimately decided not to press charges. Donald Trump is leading with male voters and is leaning in, trying to appeal to the group in the final stretch before November. I spoke with USA Today Trump campaign reporter Zach Anderson for more. Zach, thanks for hopping on. Glad to be here. So, Zach, let's just uh, start with the polling, as we so often do. Really, how is Trump doing in the latest polls with male voters? He's doing exceptionally well with male voters. Republicans traditionally do better with men than with women. Trump won male voters by eight percentage points over Joe Biden in 2020. But he's now leading Kamala Harris by 16 percentage points with male voters. So that's just a huge advantage with men. And how is he really doubling down here with this hyper-masculine approach? You know, you and I have had variations of this conversation, Zach. I've talked with other reporters about Trump really leaning into this for months now. What are we seeing as we enter the final two weeks before Election Day? Trump has always tried to present himself as sort of a strong man. You know, he really is very, very focused on projecting strength. And he's used that to appeal to men. And I think he's taking it to a even more aggressive level in the closing stretch. There was this rally that he had in Pennsylvania in the hometown of golfer Arnold Palmer, who's a legend that passed away a few years ago. And Trump started the rally by talking about the size of Palmer's manhood. And he was joking around, but it was just, you know, joking around about somebody's genitalia is beyond what normal politics are about. And but it's really sort of a masculine type of a boasting thing. He's really sort of leaned into sort of guy stuff, going to an NFL game over the weekend. He's dropped a lot of profanities in his rallies. You know, he's used swear words to describe Kamala Harris, this really aggressively macho approach to really drive out the base. You know, I think that the campaign recognizes that they're going to have a problem with female voters. Kamala Harris is winning female voters by 17 percentage points in the latest USA Today poll. So similar to what Trump is winning male voters. And it seems like both of them are just doubling down and trying to drive out the voters on their base. So he's leaning into the male vote, Zach. I mean, is this approach alienating women or possibly men who don't align with these versions of masculinity? I mean, what are some of the risks here? Absolutely. There's a risk that this is going to further alienate. You know, in the past, you would look at swing voters uh, were often suburban women. And a lot of women are not necessarily comfortable with the kind of talk that Trump uses. And he's been told over the years by advisors to tone it down. He's made sort of fleeting attempts to court female voters, but it's really nowhere near as natural for him. And it it just seems like he is more comfortable with this very macho persona. And so that's what he's sticking with. And it seems like they're just going to try and drive out as many male voters as they can. It's a bit of a risky strategy because 
in 2020, young men, which is really the demographic that they're aiming at right now, voted at a lower rate than young women. So Harris has an advantage there. In terms of Harris, I mean, really, how is the Harris camp countering this approach? How are they approaching male voters? And you mentioned how she's doing with the female vote, a lot of success there. Um, is she really leaning into the female vote in similar ways? She is leaning into the female vote. You know, her campaign has really emphasized issues that maybe appeal more towards women, like abortion rights is really the centerpiece of her campaign. She also talks about, you know, health care and things that uh, women voters tend to be more interested in overall. They've also tried to sort of blunt Trump's approach by saying that this is not the version of masculinity that we should be aiming for. You see former President Barack Obama talk about this on the campaign trail and say that, you know, Trump is a bully and Trump likes to put people down and that's not what real men do. And if you think this is, you know, masculine behavior, you know, think again. They've also used Tim Walz, Harris's running mate. They pushed him out to try and appeal to male voters. He's a hunter. He's a former football coach. You know, he's from a rural part of the country. And he sort of presented a different version of masculinity as well, more sort of the Midwestern dad vibe than the super macho man. All right. Zach Anderson covers Donald Trump and Republicans for USA Today. I appreciate the insight as always, Zach. Thanks so much. Thank you. The former CEO of Abercrombie & Fitch has been arrested and charged with two others in the operation of a secretive international sex trafficking scheme that lasted for years, cost millions of dollars, and involved dozens of victims, prosecutors said yesterday. Michael Jeffries, who served as CEO of the clothing company from 1992 to 2014, and Matthew Smith and James Jacobson were charged with sex trafficking and engaging in interstate prostitution. The operation involved transporting young, aspiring male models to events in New York and other places around the world and coercing them into having sex. The men believed participating in the events would lead to modeling opportunities and further their careers. Legal representation for Jeffries has vehemently denied any wrongdoing, according to the BBC. You can read more with a link in today's show notes. Pulitzer Prize finalist Isa Davis and Tony Award winner Lynn manuel Miranda join my co-host Dana Taylor this afternoon to discuss their new concept album, Warriors. The album was inspired by the 1979 cult classic movie, The Warriors. You can find the episode right here today, beginning at 4 p.m. Eastern time on this feed. And thanks for listening to The Excerpt. You can get the podcast wherever you get your audio. And if you're on a smart speaker, just ask for The Excerpt. Thanks to Sarah Ganim for filling in for me the last couple of days. I'm Taylor Wilson, and I'll be back tomorrow with more of the excerpt from USA Today.